think that last song should have been Samson's song, really. He stands in that temple, my chains are gone, and he's able with one, with his dying breath, to do something different. Now look at Samson, as you know, we're going through the Old Testament, through different stories from the Old Testament. We've been in the Judges, we've looked at Deborah, looked at Gideon, and another one that you've probably at some point heard about, Samson, an old favorite for um, Sunday, Sunday school stories, but but Samson really isn't about a Sunday school story. Samson is a horrendous guy, not the sort of person you want to meet up a dark alley on a, on a cold night sort of thing, and very much a man of his time. His name, in actually in Hebrew, isn't Samson, it's Shimshon, which, don't worry, it's not the Shimshons, <laughs> okay? Though I think he would have fitted in quite well with, with these ones. Shimshon actually means man of the sun or sun man. He, I don't know if that was a name which his parents, we'll hear a little bit about how his parents had him in a moment, whether they gave that to him thinking that Samson is going to shine like a bright sun over the nation of Israel, going to give them hope and joy and, and, and everything else. Maybe some of their desire expressed in their children's names. You do see that. We give names to our kids, don't we? And I, We go through a process of thinking about that. In Scripture, you do see how parents, you know, they give interesting names to their kids. Imagine calling your, your son my father is the king, that kind of name. But, uh, what they hoped for him, I don't know. Sun Man, I'm pretty sure that this isn't what they expected. This was a failed Superman toy of the 1970s. Revel, whoever it was, got it wrong with that one. Have you ever heard of Sun Man, the greatest superhero of them all? No, no, not even those that were buying toys in the 70s have heard of him, so it didn't go very far. It's the Sun Man, the greatest hero of them all. In some ways, Samson is presented like this, this fantastic hero. But he's more of an anti-hero than, than a hero. A couple of weeks ago, Ben was speaking about Gideon. And Ben was a little bit too black and white for my liking. And I, I live in a very grey world. I'm not referring to my dress, by the way. But I think very rarely are things as black and white as we would sometimes like them to be. Ben presented Gideon as this, this awful guy, this uh, idolater, this person who missed the mark, a person who was a failure and a liar and a thief and, and everything else. Well, I identify with some of the characteristics of Gideon in that sense. And I think the world is actually much more grey in the sense that rather than heroes and villains, I personally find a lot of hero and villain united within myself. And most people that I deal with, they're not all bad or all good. But there's this tremendous mixture which somehow gives testimony to, to the reality of the image of God which is still within us. We are made in God's image. And even fallen humanity still testifies to some of that image of God which is there. But it is a fallen humanity. And so within that humanity you also find some threads of evil which really are quite difficult to cope with at times. That mixture, and so it is easier to characterize someone as a, as a Hitler or a, a dictator or someone that we think is all evil or a Mother Teresa, a saint, someone who's all good. But the reality for most of our lives, certainly the reality for Samson, was that he was a mixed guy, a mixed up fella, someone very much a person of his times, brought up within the ways of his times, and struggling to please God within the temptations and the weaknesses that he faced. So I hope you'll find something to encourage you in Samson's life, hopefully not to encourage you in pursuing your weaknesses, but encourage you to find the grace of God, the purpose of God, within your life as you know it, and that God can use you exactly where you are. Paul puts it in this way. He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay. To show this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And I like that image. Our lives are like that imperfect jar of clay, a very weak vessel, and yet we contain something of such incredible value, which is the grace that God has poured out into us and the grace that God then communicates through us to a world that needs him. We live in a world of imperfect people, part hero, part villain. We are imperfect people in an imperfect world. And just as God used Samson in his own way and in his own time, God can use us in that same way. Now, one of the difficulties with Samson is the world that he lived in was so different to ours. Now, this isn't quite Samson, but almost. This isn't, what do you call it, advertising, that sort of, you know, subliminal advertising. This is very in your face. Don't buy Apple, buy Samsung. No, I'm not going to say that. But. Samsung, do anyone remember their, one of their advertising slogans from a couple of years back? Imagine. Trying to create a world that you can imagine. 
And as we look at Samson, you're going to have to use your imagination. Martin already suggested that. Most of the imagery that we get about Samson's life, unfortunately, is prepared for Sunday school. I've only decided to produce one of these. One of the things it says, Scripture says, that Samson did when he was cross with the Philistines was he went out and captured 30 pairs of foxes. That's a feat in and of itself. And then he tied them together by their tails and he lit a torch, attached it to their tails and set them loose amongst the cornfields. See the little smile on his face there? These, these foxes like that. Now, that tends to be the kind of image that we have. But I'm going to hopefully draw you in a bit to try and imagine what Samson's world actually was like because it is something completely outside our experience. First of all, his parents. They're there, no kids. An angel comes down out of heaven in this ball of fire, speaks to his mum and says, you're going to have a child. Is that your everyday experience? Angels coming down in balls of fire and speaking to you. And of course, when the angel comes down, what's the first thing you say? Hold it right there. I'm just going to go home, get a goat and make a sacrifice to you. Don't go. The guy says, okay. And just like our four ladies in um, Plan Dudno, he sits on a rock to wait while she goes off, comes back with her husband, prepares a sacrifice and offers a sacrifice to him. Well, to the Lord. Then they suddenly realize, this is God himself who's come to visit us. So immediately, what do they think? Oh no, we are going to die, as you do. And the guy says, don't worry, you're going to be okay, but you're going to have a child. That's how Samson's conception or birth, that's where it comes from. Experience completely outside our own control. Then the angel, God, says to him, says to the parents, Samson's going to be a special child. I think they should have got a t-shirt like Thomas's. Have you seen what it says on it? If I'd had one like that, I'd have worn it this morning. Wild. <laughs> That's what he should have had on his t-shirt. But, but anyway, he's going to be a, a special guy devoted to God from his birth. So no razor is to touch his head. I'm going that way myself a little bit at the moment. I, I do realize. You know what happens to hair? It grows. Most hair, when it grows in Britain, we tend to wash it and use conditioner to get the tangles out. We spend time blow drying it, that sort of thing. Well, Samson's day, they didn't do that. You let it grow. And what happened? He says his hair was in seven braids, braids, mm, dreadlocks, seven matted messes coming out of his head like this, which hadn't been cut since the day he was born and certainly hadn't been washed with um, head and shoulders or anything else like that. Vows before the Lord like this. Not really our world, is it? Then he's walking along the road one day and meets a lion, as you do. Not really our world either, is it? Meets a lion, what's he do? Grabs hold of its jaw, pulls it apart like that, leaves it by the side of the road, and the next time he comes along via there, unless Alan's friend was anywhere nearby, there's some bees making a load of honey in the carcass. So he reaches his hand in amongst the bees and takes out some honey. Identifying with him so far? All part of your everyday experience? Then he comes out with this little riddle about this. And he's confronted with perhaps the one thing which some people might say, they are being very careful here, that they are able to identify with, a nagging woman. He actually meets a few of them. <laughs> that laugh was too genuine. <laughs> he meets a few of those in, in his experience. But his nagging woman gets the secret of the riddle out of him. And so he then has a debt to pay of 30 sets of clothes. So what do you do when you can't pay your debts? You run along to the nearby town, kill 30 guys, steal their clothes, take them back, and say, here you are. That's one way to approach your debts. Um, anyway, all this was in the context of a wedding festival. Whose wedding? His own. A seven-day festival going on. But when this had happened, the girl's father thought, I don't like this guy. He's run off and left my daughter. So what does the father do? He gives Samson to the best man. That's what the best man was about in those days. That if the bridegroom doesn't turn up, then the best man got lumbered with her. If he doesn't turn up, it's presumably for a reason. That's why I say lumbered, because he thought better of it. So the bride's father takes the bride and gives her in marriage to another man. Samson then decides to come back and actually get married. When he gets them, he says, I'm sorry, I thought you weren't turning up. I've given it to someone else. That's when the 30 foxes incident happens. He goes and finds 30 foxes, ties them together, puts a, a torch on their tails, set them loose in the fields. The fields are all burning. So the Philistines aren't happy now. So what do they do? They come and burn the woman and her father. Because she, uh, you know, it's all a cycle of revenge like this going on. Um, anyway, Samson's a bit upset, so he kills a few more, goes to live in a cave, gets very upset. Um, his own people get upset with him, tie him up, hand him over. When he gets handed over, he breaks the 
ropes as if they were strings, picks up a dead jawbone from a donkey, and kills a thousand people. As I say, this kind of word like that. After this, off he goes with a prostitute, spends the night with a prostitute. She obviously wasn't quite enough for him. He falls in love, not quite sure what's meant by that in this instance, with Delilah, and then the whole enactment of the scene that's there like that. Uh, foreign peoples mingling together, different religions, violence, warfare, fire, adultery, crime. <coughs> That was Samson's world. He's not just a strong man living with a smile on his face in Sunday school stories. He was someone who was living in such a different world to ours. But what we have to read through his story is how God was able to use him in his world. His world, I must say, also uh, includes the way the Bible narrates this. Sometimes we approach the Bible as if it was simple history, and it isn't. We don't have any problems with books like the Psalms, which are poetry. So when the Psalms say, the mountains skipped like rams, or the hills melted like wax, we don't expect it to be taken literally. But when the book of Judges says that Samson killed a thousand with a jawbone, we somehow expect it to be taken literally. literally. That isn't actually the way it's written. It's written as a sort of like saga of heroes, which tends to exaggerate events not in a way to deceive or a way which makes it inaccurate, but which is simply a different vehicle of communication. So don't read everything that you read in the book of Judges as if it were simple modern history like that. I'm not going to take any more time to go into that, but do understand it is exaggerated stories of the heroes of old. Campfire type uh, communication like that. So in their so different world, God was able to use Samson. That was Samson's world. Anyway, how was God able to use Samson in that way? I think the first thing that we have to understand with him was that he was a man of, of destiny. He was a man who God had put his hand on right from the beginning. He was someone who was born in response to the cry of God's people and born very much the child of promise. God spoke to his, his mum and said, you'll become pregnant and give birth to a son and his hair must never be cut for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. He was born as a response to the heart cry of God's pre people for freedom from their oppressors. He was born with purpose on his life. Now that purpose doesn't happen independently from the world that we're born into or the sort of person that we are. God is able to weave his purpose through the world that we live in and through the character that we have and the way we progress in life. We don't have to become otherworldly or super saintly. God's able to work today in all that you may find difficult in today's world. All that's moved away, where you say Britain's moved away from Christian values. God understands that. God knows that. And he's able to work in this world just as he's able to work in the, in the world of violence and hatred that Samson lives in. And he's able to work in and through you as you are because God's promise and God's destiny is on your life. God spoke to Jeremiah when he was discussing with God and saying, I'm not sure if, I can, if I'm up to this. He says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Each of us somehow is born with destiny and with purpose in God. Each of us has our role in what God wants to do in the world around us. And as Paul says to Ephesians, he says, for we are God's masterpiece, a wonderfully created piece of work. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Our life in God's sight weaves in with his purpose in the world we live in today. And part of what Christian life about is discovering and living in the good works that he has prepared for us in advance, just as he had prepared those works for Samson. He was a child of destiny. And as Samson begins to grow up, it says the Lord blessed him as he grew up, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. Can you say that about yourself? The Lord has blessed me. Of course he has. The Lord blesses each one of us. And the Spirit of God is upon us and begins to stir in us. You know, may not feel that you have fully fledged in all that God wants to do through you, but 
at least the beginnings of what he's doing is there. The Spirit of God is stirring on your life. And he wants to work through you, just as he worked through Samson. Now, dealing with God working through us, we always come face to face with this, with weaknesses. Now, God can work despite our weaknesses. Don't worry, these are not things which put blocks into God way, God's ways. But they certainly do temper what God would be able to do through us. Samson's weakness was women. Now, this is an illustration. It's not the only weakness that can stand in the way of what God's going to do through us. Um, there's lots of other things, from, you might say, major things to relatively minor things. But all of these are reflections of parts of our character where we perhaps need to allow God to work in us, to free us from things which will divert us from what God wants us to do. Samson's weakness was these women. Now, he obviously hadn't read the book of Proverbs, a book written for young men to help them in the choices they make. One of the most important choices that you make in life is who you're going to marry or who you're going to allow yourself to fall in love with, in that sense. Love does just happen, but normally we allow the circumstances to be created which lead us to that place. But one day Samson was out in Timnah, and one of the Philistine women caught his eye. Whoa, there. It's fine for women to catch your eye like that. It's what you do once they've caught your eye. Luther said, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them making nests in your hair. And so it's what we do with the initial thoughts that arrive in our minds, in our heads, and seep down to our hearts that determines what we do with that. He saw a Philistine woman and acted on that. That was the whole instant of then trying to arrange the marriage and, and all that that came through that. That was one that happened with him. And the, the, the hassles that came because of that, we, this was actually the first wife. This is during the wedding ceremony. She's actually already called his wife. This wasn't Delilah. It says, Samson's wife came to him in tears and said, you don't love me. You hate me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. Nag, 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 nag. So much. So she cried whenever she was with him and kept it up for the rest of the celebration. This was their seven-day wedding that they were involved in. That's how long their wedding was going to be. At last, on the seventh day, he told her the answer because she was tormenting him with her nagging. Now, I don't think this is a criticism of women or a suggestion that women do nothing but nag. I think it's a criticism of Samson's choice of women. I am sure there are women who drive their husbands to despair through nagging, just as there are husbands who drive their wives to despair through drink or sowing wild oats or whatever else they're going to go and do. There are clear weaknesses in other people. What's being highlighted here is Samson's lack of wisdom in the choices that he made as he came into um, to this juncture of his life and allowing that weakness time and again to strike a blow in his life. Off he goes another time. Samson went to the Philistine town of Gaza. Why did he go to Gaza? I bet it wasn't to buy bread. Normally, a, a fall or a mistake is the end of a series of steps which lead us to that. Things don't tend to just happen. Things are the result of choices that we make in our life. And he spends the night with a prostitute. Sometime later, Samson fell in love with another woman named Delilah. And you know, you saw in the story how all that was then worked out. She tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. He'd have thought he could have just said, well, I'm sorry, Delilah, you're obviously not the girl for me. I'll go and find a good Israelite one. But that's not what he did. He stayed in that situation and allowed this to get the better until, until finally he shared his secret with her. And the whole episode that results from that. Um, one of the things I'd like to highlight from that is what's happening in Samson's life as he faces and goes through these weaknesses. When he woke up, he thought, just as I had before, I will shake myself and I'll be free. This is the, with one bound, Jack was free part of the story. But that's not what happened. He didn't realize the Lord had left him. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that sad? He didn't realize the Lord had left him. How many churches would know if the Holy Spirit didn't turn up on a Sunday morning? How much of what we do can be done through our own effort, our own clever ability, our own words, our own structures? How much of our own life reflects God with us, how much would we notice 
if God didn't turn up one day. I was challenged in this several years ago, actually here in Cottage Lane, in a sermon that was being given, the message of which I remember, but the preacher I don't. <laughs> so whichever one of you guys it was was preaching then, well done, but I can't remember who it was. But. I was preaching about the Emmaus Road. Jesus was walking with the disciples on the Emmaus Road, and they didn't recognize him. God was there, but they didn't know it. God can be in a place, and you don't know it. But you can also walk on thinking that God is with you, where in actual fact, his spirit has been withdrawn. A series of events, one after the other, in Samson's life, a man who had been set apart for God's service from birth, a man who, of whom vows had been taken, a man who was consecrated to God, a series of steps took place which led him to the place where God was no longer with him and he simply didn't know it. That's a frightening place to be. And yet that's what happened. The consequence of that was painful for Samson, but it was also the way of his salvation. The Philistines captured him. I've always wondered reading that story, why they didn't just kill him. He'd gone to sleep over three different nights with soldiers hiding in the bedroom. If they were that concerned, they could have just put a sword through his throat and that was the end of it. They obviously wanted to capture him and use him as a sort of a, a trophy of triumph for their own God. But the Philistines captured him, gouged out his eyes, took him to Gaza where he was bound with chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. In other words, he's doing a donkey's work. He's grinding this, this, this machine round and round and round. Uh, a millstone, which normally have a donkey attached to it as it walks round. This is what Samson is being forced to, to do. Slavery. He's bound up. He's serving another master. And he's lost his vision. The consequences of a series of steps which took him to the place where he didn't realize that God had left him. Frightening. So as I say, this was also the place where eventually he recovers his strength. Whenever we come to a place of, of overconfidence or pride or abandoning God's ways or simply walking along in the way we've always done and somehow missing the fact that God's not there, inevitably that will lead to a crash and a fall and having to start again from the bottom up. And I imagine Samson walking round and round, this thing as he's grinding grain, and God's word drilling deeper and deeper into him. A deep experience of painful repentance and painful coming back to God as he becomes aware of what God's purpose had been for his life and how he'd failed to live up to that. His strength wasn't in his hair. Now, I know that's how the story tells it. You remember and understand how these narratives go. His strength was in the God who was with him, of which his hair was a symbol. And maybe the Philistines did forget to cut his hair, but maybe the story is actually trying to teach us something else. As sightless and bound, he grinds the grain, he finds his God again. And as his hair starts to grow, so his recovery of God's purpose for his life starts to happen. He starts to give himself back into the hands of the God who called him from birth and for whom he was set apart. So his hair starts to grow and his strength starts to return. In Isaiah we read, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, the Holy One of Israel. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. It's as he came back to God that he found that place of strength again. And so, maybe as a result of his own prayers, as he's there locked in that prison, he's brought into the temple I doubt there actually were 3,000 sitting on the roof, but there's a good number of people sitting around that place. He's brought into the temple, placed between the two pillars, no longer overconfident, no longer reliant, no longer thinking, I will get up and do as I did before. Now his heart cries to God and says, Sovereign Lord, remember me again. Please strengthen me just one more time. And so his heart cries to God. The word of God says, pushing up against them with both hands, he prayed, let me die with the Philistine, Philistines. And in his death, he killed more people than he had during his entire lifetime. I don't know if that picture reminds you of anyone, someone who conquered his enemies with his arms outstretched and in his death. Remind you of anyone? I think that's one of the grace that's given to Samson all through his imperfect life, is to be a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, who through his death, exerted the most power and the most strength 
that could ever be imagined and brought the temple of the foreign god crashing down around him. This is a temple of a relatively insignificant Middle Eastern god, Dagon. When Christ stretched out his, his arms and breathed his last, he brought down the temple of the prince of this world, the god of this world, the ruler of this age, Satan himself. That was brought crashing down around him. And we know that Jesus went on to resurrection and to life. Samson in his death was able to fulfill God's purpose for his life. And just a few scriptures from the New Testament to close. I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live now in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We find fulfillment, we find our purpose, and we find our strength as we embrace Christ's death, which is also our own death. As Paul again says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died in Christ. All that was our old life is left behind, and we died. And our life is now hidden with Christ in God. Our life is fulfilled in the same purpose of Christ's life, which is living in the purposes of his Father. And then Jesus' word recorded in the, in the Gospel of John. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Samson's was a physical death in which he saw greater victory than at any point during our, his life. Ours isn't meant to be a physical death, but ours is choosing to die to ourselves and to live to God and see his purposes worked out through our lives. And so as Paul says to the Romans, and in memory of Samson, who died fulfilling God's purpose, I would invite you to make this verse your own. It says, give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. Not going to death as Samson did, or as Jesus did in his crucifixion, but living day by day for his glory. A living and holy sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Let's do that. Let's offer ourselves to God in memory of Samson. Let's chase the weaknesses. Let's be aware of how they can lead us away from his purpose. When we find ourselves falling flat, let's seek him again and seek his purpose for our lives and live as those who are called to live as those who are dead to ourselves and living for his purposes in the world. Thank you.